Imagine the following. A new method is introduced in your field of work that would improve the quality of your service. You assign two experts among your staff to adopt a new method in the workflow. They work together very effectively to fit this new method into the existing processes. And while you regularly check on their progress, you observe that they both understand the new method very well. You're not surprised, because both are experts in their field. During a series of tests, you also see that they both show high levels of skill while applying the new way of working. The new method is successfully implemented in the workflow. Then, some months later, you observe that the new method is followed by only half of your staff. And you're very surprised to see that one of the two experts that had implemented the new method is not following it at all. These differences in compliance are probably the result of differences in attitude, which are not informed by what the colleagues know or are able to do, but rather how they look at things. One can be open to change or one can be conservative. It's what you would naturally be inclined to do. From our own circle of friends and family, we know that some people are very keen to embark on something unknown, and others are very hesitant to use a new tool, even when they fully understand how it works and how to use it. A more concrete example in public health is hand washing. Probably 100% of all doctors know about microbes and the effect of hand washing, at least hopefully. They all have the skills to wash their hands, yet only 50% consistently comply with hand hygiene protocols. Again, much of the difference between the two halves is about attitude. Attitudes are learned tendencies to evaluate our experience in a certain way. Tendencies about how you think, feel and act based on your experience. That suggests that we can break up attitudes into three components. The cognitive, how you form certain beliefs around an experience. For example, you may develop the belief that hand washing is only for people who perform sloppy work because they allow themselves to get dirty. The affective, what experience does to you emotionally, how it makes you feel. For example, washing your hands may make you feel guilty or sad because you were dirty. And the behavioral, how likely is it that certain experience will make you react in a certain way. For example, you avoid hand washing so that you are not reminded that you feel dirty. Though we said that attitudes are learned tendencies, they are sometimes the hardest to change intentionally. The most important thing is first to become aware of them. Most of us operate with little opportunity to reflect on our attitudes or those of others. We must become aware they exist and inform so much of how we approach situations, and then open ourselves up to the possibility of developing new attitudes. Knowledge, skill and attitudes. We have now discussed all three pillars of competency, which will allow a professional to practice their trade right. So are we done? Not yet. There is still one crucial trait to consider. One that informs greatly how you will actually apply these competencies in practice. Values. Let's consider the following thought experiment. Imagine a new virus that has emerged it is very contagious and it has a lethality of 2%. This means that of every 50 people that get the infection, one will die prematurely as a direct result of that infection. And nobody seems to be immune to this new virus. There is a new vaccine and studies demonstrate convincingly that it is 100% safe and 100% effective. It's just that every country is asking for it. And our estimation for this year is that we can only order 50% of what we need. We ask three community leaders for advice. They will receive all relevant information and have unlimited access to vaccination experts to answer their questions. One week later, they come with their advice. The first suggests that we should prioritize vaccination to critical social functions, healthcare, law and order, firefighters, military, etc. The second implores us to first vaccinate the most vulnerable risk groups, such as the elderly and those with underlying illness and the hard to reach people. Finally, the third community leader says that we should offer every individual the same opportunity to get vaccinated. And that in times of scarcity, we use a lottery to determine who gets vaccinated and who doesn't. Having considered these options, 
let's meet our community leaders. I wonder who came up with which advice. All right, so that thought experiment might have been a little extreme. Still, it illustrates an important role of value systems in public health. We speak often about evidence-based policy, but with evidence alone, you cannot create policy. An important element is that policies have to fit in the value system of a government, political values. Often that is aligned with the attitudes of the people, but not in every situation. What attitudes and values have in common is that they need to be discovered. A teacher can teach you new facts or new skills, but your attitudes and values are personal choices. The best we can do is to be aware of them so that we can be conscious of how they influence our behavior and decisions. In the next video, we will discuss how Transmissible aims to raise awareness for attitudes and what tools we create to help discover values. I hope you will join me then.